I'm going to talk about lack of violence in the West. I thought maybe I should start with some of the violent activities because you uh, you heard from Phil about some of the uh, battles uh, within Texas and some pretty violent sorts of events. Uh, and uh, Bruce has talked uh, both yesterday and today about violence and about, about say Comanche raids and those other sorts of things. So I thought maybe we would start with an exam question. Now this exam question cannot be answered by Ben Powell or Bruce. Uh, Benson or some of the other faculty here. In fact, I've known Bruce for 35 years, and this is my very first chance to say, shut up, Bruce. <laughs> so I'm going to use it. So faculty cannot answer this. But this is one of the areas where you might think about there being quite a bit of violence. I mean, so I'm going to talk about other areas. I'm going to talk about mining camps. I'm going to talk about wagon trains, a lot of things like that. But let's start out with one of the areas where there might be quite a bit of violence. Uh, namely, and they didn't always have to use violence, but it was certainly uh, coercion or threat of force, namely bank robbers. So for the students in the audience and medical school professors, you can still answer the question. Uh, I will give away a copy of my book, The Not So Wild Wild West, uh, and I will even autograph it for you for the person that, come that can come the closest to guessing the total number of bank robberies, it's going to be a you know, very large enough number, you're going to have to really get work at this one. So in some sense, maybe this is just a random event. But how many bank robberies in the western states, and we're going to include western or, or a list of states here, from this period from 1859 to 1900. So write down on, a, on your notes there. I'm not going to collect them. Um, you're going to have to be honest about what your vote is. But tell me how many bank robberies do you think there were over this 41-year uh, period <coughs> in these states? Okay. Uh, notice that uh, Texas is not in there, so if you know the number of bank robberies in Texas, subtract that. And it doesn't have to be students. It just has to be kind of the non-FMI uh, uh, people or visiting lecturers like Bruce. It can't... Uh, can't guess. Since Bruce and I steal each other's material all the time, uh, I may be stealing this one from him. I don't know. Uh, you're going to see some of my stuff later that I probably have stolen from his work over the years. So, your number. Got your number? Think about it. Remember, large scale prize. First prize is uh, one copy, second prize is two copies. Uh, no. So, yeah, you got your number figured out? Okay, you got your number down for the total number of bank robberies, just to give you a little bit of an event here, um, some prize involved. Uh, how, many be, how many of you are guessing we have to kind of sort this out to figure out who has the right number? So let's start between 500 and 1,000. Who are many between that number? Okay. Uh, how many between uh, 200 and uh, 500? Okay. Um, 50 uh, to 200. Okay, less than 50, three, four of you, less than, less than 20. What's your number? I'm at zero. Zero, okay, what's your number? Five. Five, what's your number? Less than 10. Less than 10? Can you give me, can you give me a number? Eight. Eight. Total, total number of bank robbers over 41 years. This comes from Larry Schweikert. Uh, now, you, how do you know? Well, he read a lot of newspaper reports, and the reason it's between 8 and 12, so I will give the prize to the 8. So you come up afterwards, and you'll get a... Do you have a copy of my book? I do not. Ah, that's great. That'd be very embarrassing if I had to give it away to somebody who's already had it. Uh, I did discover, after Terry and I published the book, and we sent it to several people, signed it, and then in a few months on Amazon, under used books, you could find the not-so-wild Wild West, and a few of them said and autograph. And it was that ever embarrassing. They figured that reselling it on Amazon was worth more than the book. So I'm going to write your name in it, and if it comes up on Amazon, I'm going to try to figure it out. Uh, 
But uh, that's an interesting question. Why so few bank robberies? You know? I mean, what's our typical picture of the West? It's a good way to start thinking about the West, isn't it? Uh, these guys ride into town. Uh, they're wearing their slickers, of course, even though it's 95 degrees on a summer day. Uh, they uh, tie their horses uh, to the hitching uh, rail. They sw swagger into the bank. The bank teller's cowering there. They say, put the money in the saddlebags, and the teller throws the money in the saddlebags. They race out of the bank. They throw the saddlebags on the horses, and they race out of town. And in a little while, the hapless sheriff is able to organize a posse, and they go after them, but they don't catch them, and those bad guys go on to rob some of their places. And so if you just look at movies and novels, what would you say? Bank robberies all over the place. Any ideas why there weren't so many bank robberies? There weren't many banks. Well, actually, there were quite a few banks. Banks were, were one of the first things that you put in once you got a town established. So that's, that's a good, that's a, a nice uh, hypothesis. But during this period of time, there were probably several thousand little towns with banks. One thing they did was they made a big deal out of the vault. They would put it in the middle of the floor, and they would have, you know, it would be difficult to get into, and it could be closed fairly easily. Any other sorts of ideas about the paucity of bank robberies? The bankers had guns? Well, the bankers had guns, but who else had guns? Everybody had guns. I mean, basically every household had a gun. They weren't necessarily there to defend against bank robbers. They were there to shoot the steer with a broken leg, or if you had a bobcat uh, outside your door, or all sorts of things. I went home at Thanksgiving. My mother, who grew up on the frontier, one time I went home at Thanksgiving, and she said, we're having turkey for Thanksgiving. And I said, we don't know, how'd you get turkey? She said, well, there were a bunch of wild turkeys in the backyard, uh, and um, I shot one of them. I said, were you sure? She said, well, I shot it in the head. I said, you shot it in the head? Sure. She said, I didn't want to waste any turkey meat. Well, my mother would have shot those bank robbers out of the saddle when they were 50 yards out from the bank. Can you imagine riding into a town where everybody's armed, and it's, some of it's, it's handguns, but a lot of it's shotguns and rifles. And they're over the door, they're behind the door, and these guys you know, roll into the bank, and the rumor goes through, they're whispering through the town pretty quickly, hey, there's some guys in the bank, it looks like they're holding up the bank. What do you think happens when they get on their horses and they start riding out? They get shot out of the saddle almost immediately. The idea that in that sort of a society you could take a valuable asset and run off with it, not very likely to happen. Okay, we're going to talk about the not so wild, wild west, and remember to see me afterwards and you'll get your copy uh, of the book. So, is this a good picture? This is a Charlie Russell painting. He actually paints the west pretty accurately some of the time, but you know this is uh, his, uh, the. Uh, uh, somebody's been shot at the saloon. You could get into battles in saloons, and, but they were more likely to be fisticuffs than they were to be uh, armed sorts of events. Um, this is, there's been some discussion of uh, space exploration, and this is kind of the typical view. Mars or space could resemble the wildest, the lawless, wild west. If we don't do something about it, we don't get some of these uh, controls in place uh, to, because there's going to be these privately funded adventurers seeking to exploit the planet. Well, that's, and that's the image of the wild, wild west. So we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to argue that there was violence, and you've heard some about it, particularly uh, violence between Native American and uh, Euro-Americans. There was other violence on the frontier at various times. But by and large, that's the book, uh, what's the question of what were their property rights? Bruce has already answered that question in much more detail than I, than I will here. Uh, but, and he had actual pictures of fish, uh, of, uh, fish traps. But they did put in fish traps uh, on streams, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Those were substantial uh, capital investments. Would you make that sort of a capital investment unless you made, unless you had property rights? Probably not. And so these capital investments reflected a, a fact that on these streams there were fairly effective property rights. And interestingly enough, Bruce talked about them husbanding uh, the, uh, the, actually thinking about long term. They seem to understand fish biology that big salmon genetically may be more likely to give off big salmon with their offspring. And uh, several years ago, some fish biologists 
uh, discovered some very interesting things if you look at salmon streams in the Northwest. Substantial differences bet between the size of salmon on some streams and others. And a real mystery, so the fish biologists looked at, at uh, fish habitat and they looked at all sorts of other things to try to explain why in the world were the fish on some salmon streams today larger than fish on other salmon streams. And what they discovered, same sort of a thing that Bruce was talking about, on the areas where the tribes had clearer rights, they husbanded those, those uh, salmon. They let some of the larger salmon go upstream to spawn. You didn't want to always take the largest salmon out. Where were the salmon smaller? When the anthropologists looked at the data, they, they found out it was at the division between tribes in contested areas between the tribes. And they would still take the salmon, but you didn't know if you had it, if you had them for a long period of time. So in those sorts of areas, they weren't as likely to husband, to make long-term sorts uh, of investments. Uh, they also used uh, totem poles to, uh, those were actually markers uh, of property rights. Uh, they were an effective way to try to define and enforce property rights. Uh, in uh, particular areas. And then on to the horse culture. Again, Bruce has given you much more of a picture here than I'm going to be able to tell you about that, but the advent of the horse did change things uh, rather dramatically. Uh, before that, with the pedestrian hunt, it was pretty difficult to take bison, unless you could run them over a cliff. And one of the kind of myth uh, mythological, uh, one of the arguments from modern environmentalists is we ought to adopt the uh, environmental ethos of the Native Americans. Why? Because they used every last bit of a bison. Well, they did. When they caught one bison um, on snowshoes in the wintertime, well, what about when they ran them over a cliff? There's a buffalo jump about uh, four miles from where my ranch was that I just sold in 2012, and there you can dig down for, a, you know, a, a, several feet and you can find buffalo bones that go back to say there was bison being run over there uh, for several thousand years and my son-in-law and I took our horses and went up and came into the back of that. And there's a big plateau that comes out in a big neck and it was actually kind of fascinating to ride through there and try to figure out how in the world you drove bison over a cliff. I really think of it as a pretty dramatic sort of an event. But what did they take from the bison? These were the people that were so environmentally conscious they used every last bit of the bison. They used the hooves, they used the sinews, they used the hide, they used all of the meat, except when you had a lot of bison. When they'd run 500 bison over a cliff, they took only the choicest meat. So what's our, what's our the ethos here that really kind of depends <coughs> on relative prices. And when the price of bison was low, they used up, um, you know, they uh, changed their behavior than when the price of bison uh, was high. Now, once you get the, uh, the horse, the, the culture change, changes quite a bit. And again, there's kind of, again, this mythological picture uh, of share and share alike. Well, I've ridden some pretty fast horses over some pretty rough country. And I can tell you, I would not be very excited about doing that a horseback. You know, trying to, they don't, he doesn't uh, have much of a saddle there. He's trying to get onto that uh, bison and stick that spear in there. Think about it if it's a common property activity or a, a joint production activity. Well, I don't know about you, uh, Tim Fitzgerald on his faster horses may be the one that gets into the bison herd and he gets them out and he gets one of them. Well, when we get done, I'm still trotting along on my horse and I say, boy, that, Tim, I'm really glad you took all that danger and you got up there. And boy, I was right behind that bison herd and I thought they were going to go left. And so I spurred my horse and unfortunately they went right. And by the time I could get there, you'd already killed three bison. And so, I'm uh, sorry, guys. I know it's share and share alike and I get my share and you get your share. And boy, this is just a, a great world in which I don't happen to get very many bison. You can't see really well on that lance, but that lance is actually marked. And all arrows were marked. And they told you who killed the bison. And the person that killed the bison got a double portion because they had undergone special risks. And then you think about the, idea, the uh, uh, whole idea of specialized uh, production or spe uh, specialized production techniques. There were some horses that were very good bison running horses. They could actually get you into the herd uh, and you could kill a bison. But sometimes those weren't matched with the greatest riders. So what happened? They developed a rental market in horses. Basically the good rider could rent a horse from the guy that had the best horse and 
It was just kind of like a contractual sort of a solution to a production sort of a problem. This tells us that these were pretty rational economic agents, that they understood property rights, uh, and they put them to work. After the Native Americans were put on reservations, uh, they still did a fairly good job of trying to figure out how to organize their world. However, in 1887, uh, well, let me talk about this before. Before, for a long period of time, there was a fair amount of trading between the Native Americans uh, and uh, the Euro-Americans. And in fact, this is a famous painting by Charles Russell called The Toll. The Indian is holding up a finger, not maybe not the one you're thinking of, but he's saying, one steer. What, what are we going to charge you to go through here? We're going to charge you a steer to go through there. And you can actually see over here uh, in the background, they're cutting out the steer or the steers that are going to be used for the toll. And so for a long period of time, there was a fair amount of trading relationships. And some of the first settlers to cross the plains discovered that Native Americans were pretty good at showing them where the river fords were or providing guide service, all those sorts of things. But then, something else that Bruce has talked about, uh, the coming of the army. After 1848, after the Amer Mexican-American War, and then after the Civil War, you get the standing army. Prior to that, if you're a Euro-American settler and you want to defend your rights, well, it could be a militia, could be something else to try to uh, help you out, but you were pretty much stuck with trying to defend them yourselves. What did that mean? That might, that might mean that you would be more likely to enter into trading agreements because you would have to try to think about, do these, people, do these Native Americans have property rights? Uh, maybe I need to try to trade for them. There's a very famous article with Terry Anderson and Fred McChesney called Raid or Trade. And they argue, and I think fairly persuasively uh, as far as I am concerned, uh, that they, uh, the coming of the standing army meant that settlers were much more willing to engage in raiding or in fighting or in taking the rights away uh, from the Native Americans. Um, the uh, numbers of battles, if you think about, uh, if you're um, a, kind of a Native American historian and you think about the major battles, they occur after the standing army is around because you can call on the army. They're backing you up. You can say, yeah, these guys are taking my rights and I want you to come in and, uh, and wipe them out. The other sort of a thing that made a, might have been a bit of a problem was being posted on the western frontier most of the time was pretty boring. And you wouldn't, there was kind of what you might call an optimal amount of Indian conflict because you'd prefer to get out there and do something. And also the, uh, the generals, the supervisors, they had some incentive to try to pad their career uh, by getting there first. Uh, and being the people could be there. This is a uh, picture of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. If any of you have ever been to that uh, site, you know it does not look at all like that. It's spread over about 10 miles up and down the river, and they continue to find a few more uh, sites where they were either uh, a part of uh, Custer's Cavalry or uh, some Native Americans who were killed there. But one of the interesting sorts of things was coming out of the Civil War you could have brevet rank. Brevet rank meant temporary uh, posting to a higher rank that oftentimes happened because a lot of the other officers had been killed. You could only keep the brevet rank as long as there was conflict. General, uh, uh, general George Custer was a brevet general. What did he want? He would have liked there to be some sort of conflict. And I'm not sure he guessed quite right in terms of uh, the form uh, of the conflict uh, that he had, but uh, it was a, a form of, but, it, but uh, there was really a strong incentive after the Mexican-American War and after the Civil War to try to solve problems because it was large-scale coercion that you could get on your, on your side. It's one of the things to think about. Large-scale coercion can really be very helpful in terms of solving some enforcement problems. Large-scale coercion can also be used against you and against other people fairly successfully. If you want to go back to the Native American case, uh, after the Indian Reorganization Act, uh, what's called the Dawes Act of 1887, uh, and then uh, the 1934 Act, what it did was to freeze allotments on right reservations, and it did not give full-fledged property rights 
to the Native Americans on their reservations. Much of the land was held in trust. Uh, looking at how that land was held in trust, it's much less uh, productive than what we would think of as private property uh, sorts of rights. So there were rights on the, in the Native American situations. They were violated in some gross sorts of ways uh, once there was an army to try to take it away from them. Wagon trains. Uh, interesting uh, case study, 300,000 immigrants uh, crossed the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains between 1840 and 1860. An arduous sort of a trip uh, involved lots of risks, probably not something that you would want to try to do alone. They organized themselves into wagon trains at their jumping off place, in, like say in St. Joseph, Missouri. They didn't always know the people that they were gathering together to make the, trip, uh, the trek across. But what they did understand was they needed some rules. So they wrote wagon, uh, wagon train agreements. Each wagon train would have basically an agreement, or you might want to call it a constitution. It specified who was in charge, what you could do if you didn't like that person that was in charge, uh, how, what, what was going to be said about rates of uh, travel. And it even oftentimes specified what would happen if you decide to break up the wagon train, because some of the, for instance, some of the draft animals were owned in common. So the, the Constitution would say, this is, how you're going to, this is how you will try to solve that sort of a problem. So they were foreseeing potential conflicts and trying to deal uh, with those sorts of conflicts. Uh, John Philip Reed is probably the most famous uh, historian of the wagon train era. And he says it's a time of sharing more than of dividing, a time of accommodation rather than discord. Now remember, in all of these sorts of cases, there was almost no federal government presence. Now, there was in terms of the army, in terms of, de of uh, defending against uh, Indian uh, depredation or defending, maybe exercising uh, undue uh, care for the Euro-American settlers. But we are looking at, kind of, if you will, a social experiment. What happens when people move into an area? There's all sorts of new ways of production, lots of different people, and there is no large-scale coercive force to try to keep order. Wouldn't you predict that this would be a place or a time in which there would be widespread shooting, looting, taking, killing? And my argument is that that is not the case, that in the wagon trains and all sorts of other cases, uh, we find that that uh, doesn't happen. Um, the mining camps are another case. I don't have a slide of the mining camps here. Uh, could have provided that one. But in the mining camps, particularly in the Sierra Nevadas after the gold strikes there, uh, very quickly those camps organized with rules about what the, uh, what, a, what the size of a claim would be. In the areas that were more productive, that appeared to be have a lot more gold within them, the claims would be actually smaller than in the areas where they thought it would take uh, more time and more effort to try to get the gold out very responsive to what they would think of as the productive sorts of conditions. But when there was a lot of gold in the ground, one of the things they decided very quickly, fighting is pretty expensive. You want to go out and do battles? There's a very valuable resource here. Maybe we better figure out a way to solve this sort of conflict. So every, uh, every um, uh, strike that we've looked at, John Umbeck is the main historian that has worked on that, appears to have some fairly clear sorts of rules. Now, one of the things they did not have were jails, because jails were pretty expensive to try to maintain. So basically, it was banishment from the, from the, um, from the mining community. But what, and they didn't even have organized uh, enforcement sorts of mechanisms. What would happen would be somebody would shout, claim jumper, claim jumper. And that would go through the camp, and everybody would gather, and there would be Again, like the sorts of cases that Bruce has talked about, a reasonably formal form of a trial in which people would present their case, uh, and there would be then, if they voted, then they would vote, uh, whether that was a legitimate claim and it had been jumped, or whether the person was uh, just working it for somebody else and that person got the chance to make their sort uh, of a case. But the mining camps are a great example of armed people, lots of valuable resources around, uh, that uh, and basically did not end up uh, with a world of anarchy and violence. What about bison? Um, bison are an interesting case. Uh, it's really another puzzle for institutional entrepreneurs. There clearly is decimation uh, of the bison herds. Uh, 
by um, you know, by 1870, we were probably down to about one million bison. We figured there was probably between 10 and 30 million bison on the plains. Nobody really knows for sure. Nobody did a great census of them. Um, the best censuses that I know actually try to figure out carrying capacity by virtue of how much grazing it took. It was they were probably around 10 to 15 million, but they dropped very quickly uh, down down, and then by 1883, they were pretty much gone. You know what that's a picture of? Buffalo skulls. Tells you something about how rapidly uh, they were killed off. The argument is, and this is, uh, my argument here is that institutional entrepreneurs solve problems when there are valuable resources that needed to be, uh, need to be dealt with. Uh, but with the bison, it's commonly held as that's a great example of the tragedy of an open access resource. That's an example I used to use in my classes a lot, lot, and once I started really looking into it, I decided that was not the case. Uh, that basically, bison were great converters of grass into meat, but they were terrible way, agents to try to get to market. So settlers ate them, railroad crews ate them, and uh, army depots, uh, army posts ate them. But trying to get them transported back east was very, very difficult. Uh, when, we were, when they were trailing cattle, and I'll come to that one in a moment, when they were trailing cattle from Texas to Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, uh, they tried all sorts of different sizes of herds. They figured finally it settled on about 3,000 head of cattle and about 10 drovers, 10, uh, 10 cowboys could drive 3,000 head of cattle. 10 cowboys can hardly drive 10 by a buffalo. So buffalo were easy to get to the marketplace they were, excuse me, cattle were very easy to get to the marketplace, uh, bison were not. So what happened? Well, it turned out that in the very early in the 1870s, uh, they discovered there was a good market for bison hides. Before that, bison had been killed strictly for their robes, for wintertime, because in the wintertime they had a great robe and you could take them and make a nice hot, make a nice buffalo robe out of them. But then in Germany, they discovered a, a method of tanning the hides so they could be used for commercial applications. And the biggest application was for belting. Uh, as you think about steam power in many sorts of factories, it takes lots of belting to drive the power from that major uh, power shaft that comes from the steam engine to all of your subsidiary sorts of points where you want to, power, where you want to apply power. And in fact, uh, leather belting was a, major, was, a, was a major market for cattle hides. And then after 1871, uh, when they discovered how to actually make the bison hides work for belting also. Then there was this tremendous race to try to kill off the uh, bison for their hides. Uh, that is seen as this period of open warfare on the bison. My argument <coughs> on the counterfactual here is a little bit hard to construct because I'm arguing that there was a historical accident that the bison hunters came along to kill them off because of the hides my argument is the cattle ranchers would have wanted them out of there anyway. And so what the, uh, what the hide hunters were doing was getting them out of the way. Uh, and then so the cattle could come on, they could convert the grass to meat, and they could be trailed to market. And so it was a much more uh, efficient sort of a way to do it. My calculations say that it took about uh, 30 cents per ton mile to get the bison to the marketplace because you had to kill them and throw them in a wagon versus two cents per ton mile to get cattle to the marketplace. Big difference. And so it's not, not surprising that bison uh, were outcompeted. They were also pretty hard to handle. Here's a case of them trying to, uh, by the way, well, what about amenity value resources? Don't we, you know, don't we want the non-consumptive value of bison? Isn't it great that there was this accident that happened that kept bison? Well, it really wasn't an accident. It was institutional entrepreneurs that said, and Charles Goodnight in this area, there's people in some other areas, uh, this is the Pablo herd in uh, northwest Montana, what's, what's now the Flathead Reservation. Um, and they're uh, trying to load bison onto a rail car. Uh, people actually, three or four places, people said these bison are pretty valuable, not for their meat, but because they're unusual sorts of animals. And it would be maybe useful to try to keep them. And so these entrepreneurs made efforts to try to capture them. Uh, the herd that um, uh, Pablo had in Kalispell, he had about six or seven hundred head. Uh, he tried to sell them to the U.S. government once settlers came, started coming in onto the uh, Flathead Reservation, uh, onto his land, lands that he thought was his and he could try to keep his bison on. He ended up sell selling them to the Canadian government. 
It took them six years to get them rounded up and moved because they were so hard to move. That picture isn't entirely clear, but if you can tell, there's a big crate on each one of those wagons. Each crate has one bison in it. And they've been able to get them in a big uh, corral trap, and they've been able to get them on into those crates, and they're, now they're going to take them to the railroad, and they're going to ship them to uh, Canada. So there was a very good, and I would argue that here, uh, entrepreneurs found ways to solve problems. And if you want kind of a, a summary statement that I'll probably come back to at the end, is in the face of lots of changes, in the face of different sorts of uh, production techniques, uh, different weather, all sorts of different issues, if entrepreneurs have the opportunity, they have a strong incentive to solve problems. Some of those problems come about through new technology, but some of those problems come about by devising new rules. Institutional entrepreneurs, people who figure out different ways uh, to try to organize the world. Well, once we did get to the cattle, it does become an issue of how are we going to get them uh, here, how, particularly how are we going to get them north. After the Civil War, there was a big surplus of cattle uh, in Texas. Uh, there hadn't been anybody particularly taking care of them during that period of time. Uh, it turned out it had been pretty productive, and so they needed to try to get uh, the cattle north. Uh, you think again, how are you going to organize that? Lots of efforts to try to do that, but the trail herds turned out to be a pretty good response to that. And they did start out by the drovers actually having to own the cattle. They would buy the cattle in Texas and they would trail them north. Why? They needed to be a residual claimant because of the risks. It was too hard to quantify the risks ahead of time and what was going to happen on the trail. So they said, you know, rather than hiring you to trail my uh, cattle to uh, Montana, I don't want to take that sort of, I don't know what all those risks are going to be. I don't know if I can uh, appropriately circumscribe you as my agent. So I'm a little nervous about that. But I'll let you buy my cattle and you can take them to Montana and you can sell them. Uh, between um, 1865 and uh, 1885, about 5 million cattle moved north. It's one of the greatest migrations of livestock that we've ever seen anywhere uh, in the world, one of the largest short-term geographic uh, shifts of migration. But after about 10 years, the risk became pretty well known, and drovers had a pretty good reputation, uh, and they were able to uh, then, at that point, just be hired. They were, they were trailing firms. They were a transport firm. So the cattle owners in the south would actually maintain ownership uh, and send them north. There was the problem of identifying them, and that's where we get, uh, there's the famous 6666 brand here, the four sixes, uh, out here at the, um, the Ranch uh, Heritage Museum. You'll actually see a big barn that has is from that, uh, from that ranch. Um, my brand is a P on the left hip and a, or on the left rib and a J on the left hip or PJ on the left shoulder on horses. Uh, my grandfather registered that around 1894, 1895. Uh, those, those were used in places where cattle ranged over large areas. Back in the Midwest and the East, there were cattle herds, but there wasn't the problem of them moving over large enough sorts of spaces. So branding as a form of identification and as a legal form of identification actually turned out they almost every territory in the West, even before it became a state, registered a statewide brand system that tells you all brands within the state and whoever owns them. And so that's a pretty well, you know, if there are cows in Montana with a PJ on the left side, they belong to me. And you try to sell them and the brand inspector will actually look up the brand and say, that PJ brand belongs to PJ Hill. We're going to send the check to him unless you've got a bill of sale. And there are still 40 or 50 cows in Montana with PJ brands on them. I sold them to Ron Clampine, and I assume he's still got the bill of sale. So when he goes to sell them and the brand inspector, uh, he can also rebrand them. But the brand inspector looks at that brand book, and he knows uh, to whom they belong. Um, how did the ranchers on the, open, on the range, how did they solve the problem of overgrazing? They solved it through the roundup. You had to round up a couple of times a year. Cattle were grazing on the open range. Most ranches had a headquarters. Uh, and they had the headquarters because they could homestead uh, 160 acres after 1909. They could uh, homestead 320 acres. And then I think it was 1913 or 1914. Um, actually 1916 that they got to the point where they could homestead 640 acres. 
That's too small for a, for a productive sized unit. My family ranch, my dad and I operated it sometimes with a hired man, sometimes with not, if we could keep him, keep him from going to Miles City and getting drunk and not coming back again, which seemed to happen on a fairly regular sort of a basis. Our ranch was 25,000 acres. That was not a cattle cave. We were a family operation. Uh, so that tells you how, how mismatched the size of the homesteading was uh, to this sort of an era. So there would oftentimes be a base, a base home base for the ranch where they would have property rights in their land. They were not allowed, however, to establish property rights beyond that except through the Homesteading Acts, and the Homesteading Acts actually kept you from having any more than 640 acres. So the Roundup, which was a joint production activity among different ranchers, uh, was a way of controlling overgrazing. You had to make sure that you stayed within the community, ba community bounds in terms of that. And so they were rounded up in the spring to brand and they rounded up again in the fall uh, in order to move the cat to take uh, some of the cattle out that would be, uh, would be shipped to market, usually two or three year old steers. I like this one because look at that uh, animal, it's either a steer or a cow, it's cutting there and you can see that horse is setting its feet and it's getting ready to make the cut with it. That's a pretty good cutting horse. You cannot really rein a horse fast enough to make them do that. But if you're riding a good horse, they'll do it. Unfortunately, back here along the edge is where I am, a herd holder. When uh, I was 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, we would uh, help neighbors uh, round up and brand, and they had three brothers that put uh, different brands on all their cattle, and so we would uh, start at daybreak in the morning and round up uh, one pasture, and then we would spend the rest of the day cutting them out by brand. You'd have to get every cow mothered up with his calf and cut it out. And I had the great privilege of being out there at the very edge, uh, holding the herd, uh, a pretty boring job uh, for the day. Um, cattlemen's associations also uh, formed to solve the problem. Uh, so these were basically uh, voluntary associations reflecting a lot of the sorts of things that Bruce talked about in terms of ostracism, customary law, not really a part of formal law. Uh, here's a line camp that was a way of, of providing for your, uh, they would put people out on the boundaries of what was your customary range and you would trail the cattle. It would be, your job was just to kind of drift the cattle back. And actually out here at uh, uh, Ranch Museum, there is a line camp uh, where cowboys would live out kind of on the borderline between uh, what we'd call customary ranges and part of your job was to try to keep your cattle uh, on your home range. Sheep came along and they did not rely uh, upon uh, the same sorts of institutions because you didn't have to join in the roundup. So there was some conflict between the sheep owners uh, and, the rain and the cattle people. Not, uh, there were a few incidents of some people killing some sheep, uh, not very many. Uh, they did still use kind of the right of first possession and if a sheep herder came into an area that wasn't uh, you know, a formal part of the, uh, of the claim of somebody else or a part of what we'd call customary range rights, uh, then uh, they would usually end up being it. But if they try to expand too much, uh, then some violence uh, might occur. Uh, there was a sheep herder on the backside of our ranch that was uh, seen to be grazing his cattle uh, or his sheep onto what my granddad thought was his property. Uh, my great uncle was kind of his ramrod and uh, he was a pretty mild man uh, and didn't uh, not uh, particularly uh, didn't hang out in the bars and get into fights or didn't carry a gun didn't do things like that uh, but Tom Preston was uh, herding the sheep and it would seem like the sheep would trail into the would graze in the wrong sort of the area and my great uncle would come out would go out there and say hey Tom your sheep are in the wrong area and Tom would say well you know sheep you can't make them stay where they don't know where the boundary line is uh, they can't show them you know, you can't keep them in. Well, uh, Frank Sykes, my great uncle, said to Tom Preston, Tom, I'm going to come back here tomorrow with a 30 out 6 and I'm going to kill every damn one of those sheep that's on the wrong side of the line. And for some reason, the sheep learned where the line was. So uh, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt bought a ranch in 1884. And uh, when he bought that ranch, he announced uh, that he was going to run twice as many cattle on the ranch as had been there previously. Two, two neighboring ranchers showed up and said, Mr. Roosevelt, you know, you bought that ranch. You got the right to run 600 of the cattle. You didn't get the right to run 1,200 of the cattle. 
And if you're going to be in this community, you better only run 600 head of cattle because that's what goes with that ranch. And Teddy Roosevelt said, well, I guess that's the rules that we live by. And so those are the rules that he chose to live by. Um, it was hard to, to fence in or to establish your property rights. Um, once you get um, uh, barbed wire, uh, Joseph Glidden, there were lots of efforts to try to invent uh, barbed wire. Joseph Glidden in DeKalb, Illinois, was probably the guy that came up with the uh, uh, primarily uh, main inventor of barbed wire. Uh, and the, um, within a few years, uh, 500,000 miles of, of uh, barbed wire was sold and made into fences. Uh, so that was an institution that basically was a technological change that made it easier to establish property rights. And I think last night you asked me about uh, is it, how hard is it to, are there property rights that cannot be established? And there certainly are, but sometimes technology really does change that. And barbed wire was one of those efforts, uh, was one of those things that dramatically changed it. It also meant that uh, where there had been some people fenced in some areas where there had been some customary rights and it created a lot of conflicts, uh, they actually outlawed fencing on three million acres that had been claimed by customary rights uh, by an 1885 act. And so sometimes the federal government came along and actually destroyed rights. Its coercive power was used uh, to take away particular sorts of rights. Um, one of the interesting sorts of things is how bad is the problem of racing uh, for property rights? Uh, here's a picture of a land office, and it's probably one of those uh, that had to do with the Oklahoma land rush in 1893. Homesteading, which said that you could get 160 acres after 1862, the first Homestead Act. Uh, there was a Timber and Culture Act of 1873, the Desert Land Act of 1877. Um, the um, Mineral Act that, uh, that Tim talked about, a Mining Act, um, and then finally in 1909 it was expanded to uh, 320 acres and then in 1916 to 640 acres. But there was a strip in Oklahoma, um, part of, uh, that had been Comanche land, or excuse me, Cherokee land, and it was opened up for homesteading. Uh, there were about 10,000 people standing in line uh, nine people died standing in line to get involved to get the Oklahoma land rush. Uh, there were uh, they figured out there were between uh, between 100 and 150,000 uh, racers for 35,000 claims. One of the things that oftentimes centralized control of property rights what it does is it actually encourages racing, and so the Homestead Act required you to live on the land. So it really enforced you to force you to go out there and be there for a period of time. It started out at five years, and then they finally reduced it to three years. But you could say it was a three-year starving time, in which you had to prove that you could be there. But there was a strong incentive to be there prior to it being worthwhile, because that was how you had to establish your property rights. So in technical economic language, you would dissipate the gains, or you would dissipate the rents, the discounted stream of future rents, that came from there by figuring out how soon uh, that you could get there. You could ask, well, why did the Homestead Act stay in place for so long? There was, you know, from 1862, and there was still homesteading going on in the 1920s. Probably the last of it was in the mid-20s. You know, mid a long period of time for a very inefficient sort of an institution. Well, politics can make a difference, and Eastern politicians could make a big deal out of, we are giving free land. It was supposedly you were giving away free land. You weren't bidding for it with money. Prior to the Homestead Acts, the federal government tried to get rid of its land, but it got rid of it by allowing people to bid for it with money. After the Homestead Acts, you still bid for it, but you bid for it by building your cabin and living there uh, for a period of time. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, there was a certain amount of fraud involved with the Homestead Acts. Uh, the first act said you had to build a house uh, 12 by 14, and this guy has just built a house by 12 by 14. Uh, you can see it there at his feet. Um, but, there, but it was a fairly rough sort of a period. I always thought this is an interesting uh, picture of a homestead family. Uh, notice the cow on top, on top of the sod roof. Um, in many areas, 80% of the homesteaders failed to prove up because it was such an inefficient mechanism uh, for getting property rights. It was very different than what we call land claims clubs, 
where people would go in and they would claim land. Uh, it was squatter settlement. It was outside of the legal system, but they established their property rights, and they did it in a much cheaper sort of a way. And then I'll close with a picture of my wife and our two daughters. Oh, no, that's not them. <laughs> Actually, my wife doesn't think that's very funny. Uh, when I married her, I took her to eastern Montana to a house that wasn't too much different than that. It did not have running water, uh, and it, it looked uh, quite a bit like like that, so that actually could be her and our uh, and our daughter there. Okay, I will close with what sorts of lessons do we learn from the Wild West? I would say, what do we learn from the West overall? And I wasn't charged with giving a summary of the entire conference, but I'll do it anyway. And people can come along and offer different sorts of summaries. I would say one of the basic sorts of ones is institutional entrepreneurs do see benefits and costs, and they find ways of trying to solve problems, and Bruce's work on Native American cultures is a great example of that. These were people that decided they had to figure out how to cooperate at certain sorts of margins. Uh, customary law is a way of promoting cooperation among people. The other important sort of a lesson, though, is that people closer to the institutional change, what, what I would call residual claimants, these are the people that have the greatest incentive to find the ways to solve the problems. And the farther you get away from the people that are right involved with the problem, the more likely you are to get, to get rules uh, that don't work as well, that don't solve problems as well, or waste a lot more resources. And then this is a difficult one to try to put into place, but if you're going to go with top-down institutional change, uh, then you probably, there is what we would call a principal agent problem, and you're going to have to have political agents and you probably are going to need uh, some sort of constraints, formal constraints, call it constitutions, contractual agreements uh, of some sort to, cut, to try to constrain the political agents because they're acting on your behalf and they don't necessarily have an incentive to act on your behalf. If you have a very localized sort of a regime, then those people themselves are probably residual claimants uh, to the gains from institutional change, from institutions that work well, so in those sorts of situations, you're much more likely to get uh, what I would think of as efficient sorts of institutions. So, not so wild, wild west, not necessarily.